very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together now as we uh, sing the doxology and give thanks to the Lord for his provision for us. Please stand. Father, we have uh, prayed for the Lopez's in, in the Royal Puerto Rico, and that's a mission work. And it's a mission work that is supported and has been supported um, by congregations like this. Father, we're so thankful uh, that our missionaries do not, um, do not have to go around seeking and asking, uh, knocking on every door spending so much of their time raising funds, um, but that the giving of your people for the love of the gospel and the sake of your glory allows them to go forward not only in this country, uh, but throughout the world. Father, be pleased, O oh God, to continue to instill in us that love of giving, that compassion and mercy that seeks not only the good of this congregation, uh, but the building of the church throughout the world. We pray it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of salvation is in the blue folder in front of you. Beneath the cross, it's the third uh, hymn in that book.
seated. Open your copy of the scriptures to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. I'll be reading verses 5 through 16. It'll take us three weeks to get through that passage. Matthew 10, 5 through 16. Let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, your word does not return to you empty or vain. Because of the power of the Spirit who inspired the original authors and throughout these many generations overseeing the preservation of that word for us today. So we pray that you would make us careful hearers, attentive to what we hear taught and that what is taught may be faithful. And we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I read to you now the word of God. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold, nor silver, nor copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That is the word of the Lord. It's a summer Saturday. You take your lawnmower out. You roll it out of the garage. You look left, right, across the street. Make sure there's a, a, if there's a neighbor out, you want to greet them because you don't want to be a snob in the neighborhood. So you want to say hello and you say hello. And as you start to crank up the lawnmower, you see two uh, young men riding bicycles coming down the street. They have clean white shirts, black tie. They have dress slacks, unusual for riding a bike in Ohio. And immediately, you come to a conclusion. Who are they? You know who they are. Because whether you grew up in California, or Utah, or Ohio, or New Jersey, same uniform, riding the bikes, same kind of tie, and the same message. You are familiar with it because they represent something that has become recognizable. They have been given instructions on how to dress, how to speak, so there is an amazing consistency wherever they go. Well, the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ represent him. And as Jesus Christ has called the twelve to himself as apostles, he has named them to be his apostles, his, his envoys, those who sent out with his own authority, he gives them instructions that there may be consistency with what he himself taught. Consistency with his own message. Consistency with who Jesus himself is. 
For they are to represent him and not themselves. What we proclaim, the Apostle Paul would later say, is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. And that's exactly what Jesus is teaching them to do. He gives them instructions that their mission might be faithful. You and I know that often when we are given something to do, we like to put our own little spin on it because we present often the case ourselves. We want to bring ourselves to the situation. Have you ever told an older child to go tell a younger child something to do and somehow that older child with that air of authority goes down and adds a little something extra to it that expresses their own uh, view of their own private authority as the older child? You send them downstairs and say, Mom said you better clean up this room or else. Now, Mom never said or else, but you know, you're the older child and you're going down there and you want to assert a little bit a little assertive with a, with a younger sibling, and you say, or else, because you're the older child. And that's not the way it was to be with the apostles. They were to perfectly represent the Lord Jesus Christ over the next three weeks. Uh, as we go through these verses, 5 through 16, we're going to look at that. Because the apostles' work was to point to Jesus. That's why we don't pray to the apostles. We don't bow down to images of the apostles, statues of the apostles, because they are apostles after all. So this morning, we're going to look at three things. First, the apostles proclaimed Jesus to his own people. Jesus sent out these twelve, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. Jesus is the Messiah spoken of by the law and the prophets. Jesus is a very specific person. He is not given to the imaginations of man to create him to be something that he is not. We don't create a background for him, though even early in the church there were fanciful pseudo-gospels that sought to add a little more information about Jesus' youth and what Jesus was like as a child, because people are naturally curious, and where people are curious there's always someone to kind of fill in that curiosity, and it's not always with anything helpful. Jesus is who the Scripture says he is, and he is the Messiah of the Jews. He is the son of King David, and King David was the king of the Jews. He's descendant from a long line of Jews in the tribe of Judah. The promises of God first came to Abraham and his descendants through the twelve sons of of Israel. The types of what would be the inheritance of all the saints was given to the Jews in a land that was fought and conquered by God for them. He drew them out of Egypt by his mighty hand. He sent them into captivity in his displeasure and anger. He restored them from captivity from Babylon to their own place, the Jews. Now, Jesus gives this instruction in two ways, negatively and positively. First, don't go among the Gentiles and Samaritans. That might strike us as pretty harsh. We've read the rest of Scripture. We know that come at the end of Matthew's gospel that the disciples, that the apostles would be sent into all the earth and not just to the Jews. But here it's just to the Jews. Do not go to the Gentiles, all Samaritans. Do not go to those who are pagans, those who are separate outside of the people of God, descendant from the tribes of Israel. Why the restrictions? Not even go to the Samaritans. Uh, there's the Gentiles who are completely, uh, so totally different. 
Then there are Samaritans which are half religion, half Jews. They're not really half Jews. They're, they're kind of uh, uh, a, a, a strange mixture of the Assyrians who had conquered, taken Israel out back in 722 B.C., repopulated it. Now, in those days, uh, among the peoples, the God of the land was the God you took care of, because He's the God who would have to take care of you. So then when the people were repopulated into the land that was Israel, the north of Palestine, they took on uh, the religion of Israel. Now, the religion of Israel in the northern tribes was not good. Itself was an intermixture of the worship of false gods. Think of Ahab and Jezebel, the prophets of Baal. So that's the people that were in, in Samaria. They were not true Jews. So Jesus said, don't even go there. Don't go to the village of, uh, of the Samaritans. Sounds harsh. But God didn't give his promises first to the Gentiles. He didn't give his promises to the Egyptians. He didn't give his promises to the Babylonians, the Assyrians, or the Persians, or the Moabites. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Now, we are reading a, a, a gospel that is an historical account. Time will come as Jesus completes his work when he will send the mission, uh, his, his people out to the world. And Paul will rightly say there is neither Jew nor Gentile in that time. But right now, it was very important for Jesus and his ministry that his apostles go to the Jews, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Important how Jesus put it. Because he had come to seek and to save that which was lost. Those who had strayed, those who were left without a shepherd, those who were lost in sin and separated from the enjoyment of the promises of God that every Jew should have understood they had a hand in receiving. Every Jew should have, uh, should have understood and worshipped the God of Israel, should have been taught properly in their synagogues should have not been led astray by Pharisees and Sadducees, should have been encouraged to rest in God's mercy, but they were not. You see, this isn't, this isn't cruel. Jesus' point is not to say that the Gentiles and Samaritans have no part in salvation. It's to say there are lost children of Israel who have not been told about the promises of God and have not been given the joy of receiving the son of David, the blessing of believing in the coming king who is now among them, the coming of the Messiah, the Savior, and to take part in the life that he alone gives. That, you look at it differently, it's tender. It's very compassionate what Jesus says here. He only sets the Gentiles and Samaritans aside for a time. So that attention might be given. In this play time in history. To the ones from whom the Savior has come, the ones to whom the promises of God first were revealed. And Paul is very much attuned to that in the Gospel of Romans, because he will tell the Gentiles in the Gospel of Romans, lest they get too proud of their place in, in the kingdom of heaven, that the Gospel was first given to the Jews. Paul was not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for whom? For the Jew first, and also for the Greek. To the Jews were entrusted the oracles of God. Time would come, not too, not, not too long from now, 
in, as, as we are historically in Matthew, that the gospel would go out. But right here, for those who are to first inherit the promises, should go the good news. Now, our Jesus is a Jewish Jesus. Now, he's our Savior. But when God sent him, he was born of the virgin, a maiden of Israel. Our Jesus is not an American Jesus. There's a, there's a song that comes on, uh, I think it's usually around Christmas time. Some children see him lily white. Some children see him olive skinned. And it goes on to, uh, to impress upon how different, different nations see Jesus in different way. There is one Jesus, and you know who he is? He's a Jesus born of the virgin, maiden of Israel, a Jewish Jesus. A Jewish Jesus for the nations, but a Jewish Jesus. All the background of the Old Testament, you do not have the background of Jesus coming out of India. You do not have the background of Jesus coming out of the United States or Europe. The background of Jesus is firmly entrenched in the, in the Old Testament scriptures where we must know of him because they reveal him. Who do we proclaim to the nations? I wonder if sometimes we proclaim an American Jesus. A Jesus that seems to agree with everything about our nation. Isn't it uncanny? The apostles proclaimed the Jesus who was sent to his people. And yes, we are now his people. We have been engrafted. And thank God for that. Well, secondly, the apostles proclaimed the urgency of faith in Jesus. Proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John the Baptist taught, what Jesus taught, and now what the apostles are sent out to teach. And there's an urgency to that message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The rule and reign of God through his Messiah, bringing salvation and judgment. First salvation, but then judgment will come. But that message is not just to say, hey, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then people just go, oh, okay. It calls for a response. John the Baptist attached a response to it. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and there's something you ought to do in response to it. And that's exactly what the apostles were sent to do. They were sent to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand and call for a response. Now, the words at hand, and there are um, various interpretations of the significance of that word. It's actually an important word at hand. Some mean uh, that uh, some see it as saying that the kingdom of heaven is now come, fully come. It's fully come. But I think at hand has a different designation or a different understanding. And I, and I think there are some illustrations that can help us. And we've looked at this already in Matthew chapter 4 when, when Jesus had pronounced it. So this is somewhat of a review, but an important one, I think. At hand. If you were uh, 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 sailing on the ocean and you looked around you and you can see the horizon, can't you? You can see it better than can you see in the mountains. You can't see the horizon very well there, but uh, you, you see it. And it's empty. And you look around, you don't see anything. But then, but then something tips over the horizon. Then all of a sudden you see it. It is there. It has entered into now, into your view, into your space, and it is at hand. It is now visible. It's not an imagination. It's not wondering what's over the horizon. 
It's not thinking, well, somewhere oh, way over there, there may be land, an island, I don't know, another ship. I don't know. This is something that is now perceivable to the senses. It has crossed over the horizon. It is now apparent and there, and you must respond. Because it's not guesswork. When you, you like mystery movies, right? Detective stuff, Perot and all that stuff, right? You like those things. So if you didn't have a watch and you weren't as attuned to time as you might ordinarily be, there's something that happens at the end of every good detective show and mystery show. The, the, uh, the star, the detective, the sleuth gathers everyone together in the parlor. And instinctively you know what, what's going to happen. Before he ever says a word, what do you know is about to happen? He's going to say, who done it? He's going to expose everything. And you're going to get the answer to the solution to the mystery. And you're going to, even before he says a word, because the solution is at hand. The arrest of the murderer is at hand. You don't say, well, you know, man, they're in the upper room. I wish we, you're, you're lamenting, oh boy, we're never going to find out who it is. They're in the parlor. <laughs> You know what's going to happen. You know the fullness of the solution is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. All the signs are there. One more. If you've ever, maybe kids, kids, you ought to do this, right? Your, your grandparents are coming over your house. And what are you doing as, as a child when you know your grandparents are coming over? Are you in your room playing video games? Hope not. You're, you're, go, you're watching through the window. All right? Because there's your driveway, and you can see the street a little off to the side, and you can see down the street, and you know what their car looks like. And as soon as that car makes the turn, what do you say? You don't say, I hope they come soon. <laughs> you say, they're here. Well, they haven't pulled in your driveway yet. They haven't walked in your door. They're not fully there, but they are at hand. All the signs are there. No more highway traffic. No more stoplights. They have pulled around the corner. They have come over the horizon. I see them. All the signs are there. There's nothing left. They are at hand. And then you respond to it. You get giddy. You jump up and down. You want to race out the door and be the first to greet them. Jesus was incarnate. John proclaimed the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's visible. The signs are all there. The Messiah has come. The apostles had to proclaim Jesus' message with confidence, without stuttering, without holding back. The kingdom of heaven is not over the horizon where we're wondering, will it ever come? It is visible to the sight and the work and ministry in the very person of Jesus Christ who came. The kingdom of heaven, the rule and reign of God through his Messiah for the salvation of his people and ultimately the judgment is now right there. And you have to respond. It didn't mean that the fullness of all that the kingdom meant had already been experienced, because there's so much more for us to experience, brothers and sisters, so much more for us to experience. But oh, it's at hand. And you cannot deny the signs. The scriptures are ours. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. The church continues to increase and grow upon the face of the earth as Christ builds his kingdom. The apostles finally showed forth Jesus' signs of the kingdom of heaven. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. Earlier on in chapter 10, just a few verses ahead of this, we, we, we find Jesus 
calling his apostles and telling them what they were given to do, right? Very similar to Jesus' own ministry, right? You see this, and you say, Jesus is sending them out even to raise the dead. Jesus gave them his signs to do. They were apostolic witness, the signs that they would perform as Jesus gave them that authority, but they were not signs of apostolic power. They were signs of Christ's power, which he authorized his apostles to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Not in the name of Peter, not in the name of Paul, not in the name of Bartholomew, not in the name of uh, Simeon, not Simeon, not in the name of Matthew, in the name of Jesus. Now, this is the connection now between the proclamation of the kingdom of heaven, the urgency now. You must respond. And today, today is the day of salvation. Today there's an urgency to respond to the gospel if you have not responded to it. Because you cannot say, well, I don't know, it's over the horizon. It's not over the horizon. The kingdom of heaven is here. The signs of the kingdom show the promise of the new life that Jesus brings. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. You know, when you see, when you read the scripture and Jesus raised someone from the dead or Jesus himself raised from the dead, you should not think to yourself, I wonder, I wonder where the reign of God is. I wonder when God is going to come in and address the curse. I wonder when things are going to, uh, your change is going to be, uh, to be coming and, and salvation is going to be our view and not looking back to the curse. I want, it's there. Raise the dead. When you see that, you can't, you can't be hesitant. You can't say, I don't know. I don't know, maybe the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Maybe it's not, but that, that dead girl is now alive. Lazarus has come out of the tomb. I don't know, maybe the kingdom is here, maybe it's not. No, it's in front of your eyes. And they were sent to do the signs of the kingdom. Jesus' own signs to bear witness to it, cast out demons. They lose their power. They submit to Jesus his word. They submit to his apostles because they're Jesus' apostles. And these things are the very evidence before the eyes of the people that the kingdom of heaven is upon them. Now those signs have ceased. But they haven't ceased because the kingdom of heaven has receded back over the horizon to where you can't see it anymore. They have receded because they are foundational signs and the miraculous wonders that Christ gave his apostles to do that says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it came along with the very teaching of the apostles about that kingdom and about the salvation that the Messiah bring. And because it was already borne witness to by the apostles as the official test of, uh, witnesses of Jesus Christ, there is no longer any need for those signs because the fullness of the kingdom has not come. There will be a time when there will be no sickness, when there will be no death, when there new, will be no no suffering, when there will be no demons popping around. But that is not now. We still get sick. And we still bury our loved ones. We still do. But it's too late for the devil. And it's much, much too late for the curse because Christ has already borne it. And there is no victory in death because Christ has won the victory. So what are the signs then of the kingdom of heaven among us? The word and the sacraments, the visible church itself is a testimony to the world that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That the kingdom is visible, that you see it this morning 
if you look around you, it's not over the horizon, it's right in front of you. We're a sign of the kingdom of heaven to this world. A testimony of changed hearts, changed lives. We were dead in trespasses and sins, and now we're alive in Christ. Do you not think that is a sign? That is a resurrection. We were dead, and now we are alive. We were not God's people, but now we are. Church planting. I, I, I love reform missions. Because the goal isn't just simply to make individual Christians here and there, but to build a church. To, to see a church grow, a visible testimony, set among a people of the kingdom of heaven that is among them, as they worship him in spirit and truth as they break bread together, as they fellowship together, as they baptize their children, as they show forth God's faithfulness to his covenant. The apostles were to do the signs of the kingdom so that everyone would know it's here. It's right there. I want to quote Gresham Machen. A, a founding father of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church as he addressed missions in the liberal church. They say, he writes, we are missionaries to India. Now India is in a ferment. Bolshevism, communism, is creeping in. Send us out to India that the menace may be checked. What's an American Jesus out to defend capitalism and the American way of life? You send, them, you send these missionaries to India. We are missionaries to Japan, quote, Japan will be dominated by militarism unless the principles of Jesus have sway. Send us out, therefore, to prevent the calamity of war. Is that why Jesus sent out his apostles? Is Jesus a servant of the United Nations? Missionaries are to go out and proclaim the Jesus revealed in Scripture who came to his own. They received him not, but he came to his own and he, and he sought that which was lost among them. We're to go out with a real urgency that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And yes, it brings salvation, but it also brings judgment. And we are to go out with the visible signs of the kingdom of heaven that are left to us. Word, sacrament, prayer. Preaching of God's word, the celebration of the ordinances that Christ has left to us, until the day of his return. Our fellowship together where there is truly neither Jew nor Gentile, neither rich nor poor, we might say, neither urban or suburban or rural, neither professional, day laborer, or anything else. We are one in Christ. Real missions take to the world the real Jesus with real urgency and with the visible signs of the kingdom. And we have them. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, um, we are thankful for the kingdom that Christ has brought. And while we look for the fullness of of that glorious kingdom. We know right now it is, it is near, so we live accordingly to it. Christ is building his kingdom. We see it among us. 
We see it in the table set before us. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us to remember the urgency. And strengthen us when we doubt, when we wonder. Is the kingdom really that strong? Look at it. Is the kingdom of God really that powerful? See it around the world. See the testimony of the martyrs. Remember our own salvation and what it took. Bless our missionaries, Father. Strengthen their work. Confirm them in their efforts. Build churches in Uganda, in China, in Puerto Rico, in the Ukraine, in Uruguay. Build the churches, O oh God. Raise up men for ministry and show forth the power of the kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If our brothers will come forward, please. Let me get out of, uh, out of the way, first of all. Um, please be seated, brothers. Um, as you can tell, we don't have our regular communion cups. Uh, more my fault than anyone else's. But our communion preparers have done a wonderful job in setting this before us. So it's going to seem a little awkward. We're not quite sure how these cups will respond. But we will, we will do the best together, won't we? So um, before I forget... The red is the wine. The flowered pattern cups are juice. So I'm going to set that right there. All right, the Lord Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper on the night of his passion when he was gathered with his uh, disciples in the upper room. His prayer for them, he was about to die and he was concerned for them. And, well, Jesus has always been concerned for his people. And he established the Lord's Supper as a sacrament of his own blood and body. As a sacramental sign of what he was about to do. And now from our historical perspective, look back and say what he has done. He gave himself over to the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood for us. Specifically, for us. It wasn't a general death. He just didn't put himself out there to see what would happen. And when he gathered the disciples who had been with him for so long, he instituted this to go on continually in the life of the church. Paul wrote about it. There were troubles in Corinth revolving around the Lord's Supper. It was used as just a, a, a feast. People bring their food and they'd, they'd, they'd eat and neglect everyone else. This is a communion table, and communion is an important word because it's all about our communion in Christ. So we do this together. It is why our own confession of faith says we do not have communion in private homes. We don't do, uh, do personal individual communion. Now, the church may go to someone's home, a group of members of the church, and have a, have a time together with a shut-in and have communion. But that is still communion because it's the body of believers, not everyone, but, but a, a group going and sharing that together. It is about the communion of God's people. There was one, there was one loaf, one bread, Jesus, uh, Paul said to the Corinthians in chapter 10, because there's one body. And praise God for that. Let me read to you uh, how the Apostle Paul received it from Jesus Christ himself. Again, showing that this is meant to be practiced in the church uh, through, until Christ returns. Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. The Lord's Supper is a memorial meal, and we are to remember, focused attention on what Christ has done for us. But it's not just an activity that goes on in the mind. Because in chapter 10, Paul tells us that there is a communion with Christ in this. The cup that we share is a communing with Christ. The bread is a communing with Christ. So there is in the Lord's Supper, not the transubstantiation where the wine becomes blood or the bread becomes flesh, uh, but there is a spiritual reality in the presence of Christ with us as we partake together with Him and with one another. Isn't it glorious? How Christ prepared His disciples in the church for the time of his absence, giving to us these sensible signs of what he has done for us, of his constant intercession for us, and his unceasing love and affection for a people for whom he died. The bread represents his body, which he gave willingly. And the blood, because it is blood that must cover sins, life is in the blood. And the whole Old Testament sacrificial system pointed to this. Its simplicity we have among us is, to, is, is owed to the glory of Christ and his fulfillment. We no, no longer need to go get an animal and slay it and offer it up. Nor do we have to do it all every day and every day and every day. Christ is, has so made it so simple. No other blood will do. Let me pull that hymn. I, I, I laid it out open because as we sang this, it's a wonderful hymn for communion. We wonder at such mercy that calls us as we are. For hands that should discard me hold wounds that tell me come. Come to the table. If you have been baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, if you have professed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, have been received into communion either in this church or another church of the Lord Jesus Christ, come to the table. If you are part of the body of Christ here or anywhere else, come to the table. If you are weary and worn with your battle and fight against sin, his wounds tell you, come. This is not a table with a stiff arm to hold back the sorrowful, grieving, lamenting sinner. It is rather to gather you to him and to one another that you might remember his great love and the covering of your sins and the atonement for all that you have done and find strength today in him to keep fighting that battle against the remnant of sin in your life and put to death the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit. His wounds tell you come. But if you are not baptized, you have not been received to the Lord's Supper, have not made public profession of faith, um, let it pass. And then come and make that profession. Be baptized. Profess your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to the table. 
if you are walking in un willful, unrepentant sin, that is, it's not a battle, it's, it's, it's you're on the enemy's side. Um, you're, you're, you're living a life of sin willfully, unrepentantly, then let this go. You've not properly examined yourself. You've not properly understood either yourself or what Jesus Christ has done. And to come to the table in such ignorance is a great danger to you. If you're under the discipline of the church that has um, withheld from you the sacrament of our communion with one another because you have broken communion with the church. Um, make peace with God and make peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ and be restored to the table before you come. But I leave you with his wounds say come. Let's pray now and ask that the Lord would set aside uh, these common elements for so sacred an important and edifying use. Let's pray. Oh Lord our God, we pray as Christ once raised the elements before his disciples and taught and instructed them uh, before he went to the cross, we pray that you would make these elements the cup representing Christ's blood and the bread, his flesh, uh, to be for us the sacred meal of sweet communion with our Savior, that we would not only remember we are washed by his blood, but in the spiritual union with Christ through the receiving of these elements, we pray we would be strengthened in an understanding of their benefit to us all our days, and in all our struggles and of the giving of his body, his flesh on the cross on our behalf, that we may be strengthened by the power of the cross to serve you and live for you and love one another. For we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On the night in which Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread and having given thanks, he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, now give it to you and said, take all of you and eat for this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, the bread is gluten-free bread.
the Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples, take all of you and eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Also after the supper, the Lord Jesus Christ took the cup and gave thanks as we have done. He gave the cup to his disciples and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. The red cup is wine, the flowered cup is juice. The Lord Jesus Christ said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All of you drink of it. Our great Father in heaven, we are delighted to be through adoption, your children. Um, and we're thankful for the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has made it so. Father, we pray that you would um, work in us what is pleasing in your sight uh, through our sharing together of this communion meal, that we may not only individually, but corporately, unitedly walk in faithfulness to you. Um, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our concluding hymn is number 442, Blow Ye the Trumpet, Blow 442. 